How's it going, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. We are again back on our Thursday schedule. So we have a really fun, um, super technical and informative uh, session for everyone to go over today. Uh, as you guys have seen from the title, this is an entire stream devoted to anamorphic filming. Uh, we're going to be covering a ton of different topics uh, about lens choices, you know, de-squeeze ratios, uh, what options are available in the cameras. Uh, I'm going to be joined by Matt Frazier in a few moments, uh, who's going to really kind of lead a lot of this conversation. But most importantly, we want to hear from, from all of you in, in the viewership. You know, what kind of questions do you guys have? Uh, obviously, we're focusing heavily on uh, videography and anamorphic for this particular week, uh, and we've got some cool stuff to show you guys with that. But if you have other questions, make sure to drop them in the chat. Use the tag at Lumix Cameras, so the actual at symbol Lumix Cameras, uh, and I will be able to see it on the platform here. Uh, if you are new to this platform, welcome. Uh, if you've been here before, welcome also. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the Lumix Cameras channel. We do these streams every week, uh, Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, really just designed to cover a wide variety of different topics. So, uh, with that, I'm actually going to bring uh, Matt Frazier in over here and make sure I do this correctly. So, hey Matt, how are you? Hey Sean, how's it going? Hey, I did it right. <laughs> <laughs> I am here. You've got me on the camera. So I want to I want to point something out. You said this is a fun topic. Uh, fun and Matt Frazier do not go together. It's it's more like boring, but beneficial. So this is a boring, beneficial episode on anamorphic lenses. No, nah, no. Nah, come on, man. This is this is this is legitimately one of the more fun topics I think any of us get to really talk about because you know, just filming day-to-day -day stuff is 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 great, and a lot of the people that join us on these streams are are working. They're professionals. They've been doing you know this kind of filming for a while. But this is one of those topics that I know, in the f little over five years that I've been here working at the company, um, and the couple years longer that I've known you, this has been one of those areas that you've pushed really hard with on our company to, you know, really embrace and and start kind of democratizing this type of, of filmography for average consumers because this is something that, that we all see every day but we've not really gotten into that much at least I know for myself and I mean come on look at me I'm I'm you know one of the best filmmakers in the world right <laughs> <laughs> well, wink wink nudge I, nudge <laughs> well I've been fascinated with the use of anamorphic lenses for years and years and I've always liked the cinemascope look. It's always been something that has drawn me. So when you learn how you produce that cinemascope look, uh, you know, initially everybody wants to crop the top and bottom and then it just doesn't give you the aesthetic. So uh, that's really where it, it came for me was I wanted to replicate that aesthetic and I didn't want to have to use a $40,000 camera in order to be able to do it. Um, we saw this momentum with anamorphic lenses in the marketplace, so we figured it would make a lot of sense for us to try to um, give the tools necessary to be able to properly shoot with these lenses. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited for it. Uh, you know, my, my legacy in this dates back to the GH4 when we uh, produced the first anamorphic mode in the GH4 uh, where you couldn't correct anything in the camera. It was, a, it was a, a difficult product to shoot with. And so when I see the refinement we have today in cameras like the BGH1 and obviously the S1H and even the S5, um, it gives me a lot of gratification. It's exciting to see. Yeah. Yeah. And um, before we go too deep, I want to actually make a shout out to um, the company Suryu. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I, it's one of those I've never been great at pronouncing names of, of products or people. Um, they provided us uh, a couple of lenses for me to be testing out here. Uh, if you've seen uh, what we've been talking about, if any of you are, are following myself on the different social platforms, you've seen that I've posted some things about these, but it was one of the kind of uh, launching points with the conversation that Matt and I have been having for a while now about wanting to do a stream specifically about anamorphic. And after hearing the incredibly positive results uh, that you all in, in the um, community reached out and said, you know, yeah, you would want to see this. That's what, uh, you know, kind of brought us to this, uh, this, this area. So I want to just remind everybody again, if you guys have questions, drop them in the chat, uh, with 
uh, at Lumix cameras, like a couple people are doing in there. Um, we will be stopping periodically throughout this. We have a bit of a canned presentation to kind of go over first. Uh, so we'll get you guys some answers through there, but, um, I don't know, Matt, you want to jump into kind of, uh, uh, what is anamorphic lenses and, and what the big deal is? Yeah. So I'm going to pull up a presentation really quick here. Um, but I think what's important to note is that even though Panasonic has anamorphic modes and we use the term anamorphic, uh, anamorphic is a lens. Anamorphic is not a camera function. It's, it's important that people understand that. When we put an anamorphic mode in, it's really to optimize the camera to get you the most benefit from using that anamorphic lens. So um, when we talk about anamorphic lenses, it's important to understand that most lenses are what we call a spherical piece of glass. Um, anamorphic lenses are cut from a different cloth, so to speak. Um, they're actually cylindrical panes of glass. And so when we look at how they work, for projecting the image onto the camera. They do their job, they do similar jobs, but they do them in a very different way. So if you look at the presentation at the bottom on the uh, spherical lens, the goal of that lens is to squeeze the image, but we're gonna squeeze it equally in all dimensions so that we have a properly geometrically correct image that we're just shrinking down so it'll fit on that camera. That's the goal of a spherical optic. Whereas with an anamorphic optic, what we're trying to do is we're squeezing only left to right in this case. By squeezing it horizon or horizontally, this direction, um, we can then fit a wider angle of view. We can fit more information into the frame, but we still need a spherical lens. You gotta have a spherical optic that can then take and compress that image and squeeze it back down to fill on our sensor. So yeah. um, Sean, uh, we're gonna give away a little secret now. Um, I think you might be on an anamorphic lens right now. So, yeah, so you've just you just changed your perspective. Everything's good. Yeah. So we're looking at at as we were just talking about. This is that corrected field of view, and I'm looking up a little bit because I have a monitor attached, so I can see this. So this is that corrected field of view. But what Matt's talking about is this is how that image is actually projected onto the camera sensor. This is what your camera sees. This is how it's actually functioning. Uh, in the recording itself. So I'm going to jump back here with Matt, and I'll go back to my corrected screen here. And uh, we have another example of that here with Matt's camera. Yeah, so I'm using an anamorphic lens here as well. Um, my camera got moved a little bit, but... So this <laughs> lens is a two-time squeeze. It's a more aggressive squeeze than what Sean is working with right now. So when I go into the camera's menu, I have an anamorphic de-squeeze option and I'm going to have to have a greater amount of de-squeeze, which is going to give me a wider angle of view versus what, versus what Sean would be going with with his, um, with his anamorphic lens that he's using right now. And we'll, we'll divulge what lenses we're using in a minute. We'll divulge um, a lot more information about what's going on here. We're trying to keep this simple. We want you to understand that some lenses squeeze more than others. And that squeeze ratio will have an impact on how wide the image can ultimately be. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're almost there. I got it. We're up. Hey, we're coming on. All right. Okay. So now that we understand what an anamorphic lens is doing and how it works with the uh, a spherical optic in order to be able to get the image onto the, the camera sensor. Uh, why did we do this? Why are people using these weird lenses that squeeze things? Well, um, this you're going to get a history lesson, and I apologize, but that's what's going to happen. So uh, <laughs> back when I was back when I was a young boy, we had silent pictures back in like the 1910s and 1920s, and uh, when we had these silent pictures, they were shot on film stock that was a 133 to 1 aspect ratio. That means it's 1.33 inches wide for every inch it is tall. And we did that for years and years. And then all of a sudden, they decided they wanted to make these talky pictures. And what they figured out is they could take some of the film stock and they could put the sound on some of the film stock, which gave us a slightly different aspect ratio. It's called 1.37. It's called Academy. People have forgotten this exists. So everybody now calls that 133 Academy. Technically not accurate, but we're not gonna get into the histrionics here. <laughs> the, the point is, is that forever we had this 133-ish aspect ratio 
And then people started watching television. And when they started watching television in the 50s, uh, a lot of people stopped going to the movies and movie theaters got really nervous. So they said, how do we give people a more epic experience in the theater? I know, give them a bigger image and make it wider. So <laughs> the problem is, is that you can't just like crop the film because if you crop the film, then you got to blow it up. It's the same thing with what we do in digital, right? If you shoot a 1080 image and then you crop it and then you blow it up, it gets it gets choppy looking. It looks grainy. So they said, hey, we don't want to get the film stock to look grainy. Let's take these anamorphic lenses that they were using in tanks in the 1910s and we can squeeze the image onto the film and then we can project it through another anamorphic lens that de-squeezes it and you get all the film grain and all the film structure for every frame. And so that's how we, that's why we use these anamorphic lenses. That's where they came from. And none of you cares because almost none of you shoot on film. So you're probably asking yourselves, why do I care about this, Matt? What's in it for me? So we're gonna switch to our camera angles here and uh, Sean will come up first and then I'll pull mine up. Yeah. And so we're gonna show you some of the, the telltale signs that you're on an anamorphic lens. Um, yes. Today, it's really about the aesthetic, what it looks like. That's what people want today for anamorphic lenses. So right now, Sean is on a less aggressive anamorphic and he's gonna pull me up into the shot um, once I stop sharing my presentation. So <laughs> now, we go. now we're side by side. And aside from the fact that I have a gloriously beautifully lit scene and Sean's is not quite as nice as mine. Sorry, it's <laughs> just me. Um, just truth, yo. <laughs> yeah. What, what you should notice is that my background behind me is much closer. And part of that's because I'm on a longer lens. But I'm on a longer lens getting a really wide aspect ratio because my, my lens is squeezing more than Sean's. So I can have more compression. I can bring that background closer to me and get a wider aspect ratio than Sean can because of the lens that I'm using. Also, if you look at the lights on my Christmas tree right here, let's point, like, let's point it right like that, there we go. Or the little tree that I have over on this side, um, you'll notice that mine are really oval shaped and Sean's are a little more rounded. He has a little bit of oval, it's not quite as much oval as what I've got. And so that's where we get that, that look of anamorphic. And then Sean, we, we all want to show him the real reason people want to shoot anamorphic, right? Oh yeah. So uh, you got, you got to queue it up in three, two, one. It's all about the lens flares also. Anamorphic lenses give you a very unique lens flare, very popular, um, has a real kitschy style to it. And that's, it really, People love anamorphics because they create a less perfect image. <laughs> and so it's, it's what we celebrate in this product. And there are certain drawbacks to the one I'm using. You know, I keep talking about how much better it is. Mine's also a heck of a lot more expensive. I'm using <laughs> like a nine, that's a $10,000 lens that, I'm, that you're having to endure hearing me talk on right now. Um, this is a 32 millimeter. I just threw the lens cap. Um, <laughs> So, As I'm pretty sure is, half of our viewers just had a heart attack thinking that was the lens. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's this lens cap. So why don't you show them the uh, Sirui in comparison? So it's a 32 millimeter. And uh, Sean, what do you want? Uh, so I'm shooting on the 35 millimeter uh, because one of the, the challenges, like what we were just talking about, is obviously working distance as well. If I put the 50 millimeter on this, you're like right here on my face. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is the 50 millimeter 1.8. That's a 133. And then the one that's on the camera is a 35 millimeter 1.8. That's a 133 anamorphic as well. Yeah. And I'm on, I'm on T2s. This is a T2 anamorphic. Um, this is a 32. Uh, I might be at a little longer focal length than you are right now. Um, I'm on a, I'm on a hundred, I'm on a hundred millimeter anamorphic right now. So lots of compression in my image. So oh yeah, that's kind of fun. Um, the other lens that we're showing that's in my side camera that's that we used to de-squeeze, that's a 50. Um, and it's bigger than the 32 I just held up, just to give you some idea of the size differences we're dealing with here. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for some of the people asking in the uh, chat, that's one of the, the things that you know we were pointing out with this stream and why it took us a little bit longer to actually get this stream 
uh, ready to go so that we could present it because we wanted to do this in anamorphic. We wanted to broadcast to you guys in anamorphic, and it's not it's not as simple to get these things to plug into web streaming services. <laughs> yeah, I think after I'm, using all two, the I'm using two computers right now, just so you know. Yeah, <laughs> one of them is outputting over a USB port from one camera into one computer, USB port from this camera into another computer, and then I'm kind of coming in. It's yeah. my table looks like a nightmare right now. There's so many wires running across. Yeah, but what's what's important about this is that you know, like you guys get to actually see the results because while there are some some out there, I know that understand this topic and and shoot with anamorphic lenses, whether you're doing your own DIY kind of anamorphic lenses, which um, I think we can talk about a little bit later as well, Matt, uh, or Absolutely. you're you know, or you're looking at getting something like the Sarius um, for or Sarui for uh, Micro Four Thirds, or you're actually looking at something like the uh, lenses that Matt's using on the full frame cameras, it's not as hard as I think a lot of people think. It's just can be a little more expensive than I think a lot of people realize. Well, and I think I think the key here is we want to show people all the levels that we can do this in. I don't want you thinking this is a comp complicated process. It's complicated for us because we're having to switch multiple camera angles. Um, that that's one of the cool things about our cameras, actually, is we can actually de-squeeze the image over USB. So we're able to do this stuff right now for you. Um, uh, truth be told, Sean and I didn't realize it until we kind of were playing around and we said, oh, they de-squeeze over USB. <laughs> so let's try this out. Um, <laughs> So what we're going to let's head back to the PowerPoint because I think yeah. now that they understand what's happening with the squeezing, the basics of the squeeze, I want people to understand that as they start looking for lenses, um, yes. not every lens is going to cover every sensor. So let's exactly. talk a little bit about sensor size and how this is going to impact the lenses they can work with. Yeah, um, definitely. And again, for everybody that's that's in the chat. Um, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras uh, with the question that you have. So start the question by at Lumix cameras. You should get a little uh, pop up there um, and we'll be able to answer those questions as we go through. But um, yeah, Matt, let's uh, jump into sensor sizes and what fits. Okay. So we're going to go through just a few popular film stock sizes for, you know, cinematic productions. Um, I'm not going to go through every one of them. I promise we're going to go through three. Um, the first one is IMAX. We want you to have some perspective on how big this film stock and these sensor sizes are. So um, this is just to give you sort of a comparison in size. Um, IMAX is huge. Uh, it's a gigantic piece of film. Um, how big is it? Well, there's something called VistaVision, which is a large format. Uh, VistaVision is almost the same size as 35 millimeter film for a photo camera. Um, they're, they're 24 by 36. This is the 37.39 by 25.32. It's big. And you can see it's dwarfed by IMAX. So um, that's why J.J. Abrams gets to shoot in IMAX, the rest of the stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> so then there's 35 millimeter Academy. So this is the four by three aspect ratio or 137 to one or 133 to one, depending on how big a purist you are. Um, this is the film stock that almost every anamorphic movie you've ever seen was shot on, especially stuff in the 80s, 90s, um, all the way through the 50s. That's the film stock. And that means that there's a huge amount of classic anamorphic lenses that are designed to cover that sensor size or that film stock size. Uh, so when we start looking at uh, video, uh, you know, digital sensors, what we end up here is that that is the size of the S1H. That's its full open gate aspect ratio. The S1H can film video in that aspect ratio which is basically Vista Vision. No one would no one would call you a liar if you shot in this and said you shot in Vista Vision. It's that big a sensor we're dealing with here. Um, when we go to the anamorphic mode on cameras like the S5 or cameras like the S1H, um, that mode is a we call it a Super 35 anamorphic. It's really open gate uh, academy. That's the way to look at it. You can see it's almost the same size as the film version of it, the film stock version. So this is gonna get you a really close uh, representation of that, okay? Yeah. Now, a lot of video cameras have just native 16 by nine aspect ratio sensors. They don't have the traditional photo aspect ratio or four by three aspect ratios. And so when we look at a camera like the Evo One, which is a 16 by nine aspect ratio sensor, you can see it's a little bit wider than the uh, anamorphic or the Academy because 
this is Super 35. It doesn't use the audio channel on the film stock, but you'll see it's a lot shorter. And so that means when we de-squeeze it, we're going to end up with a wider aspect ratio and there's going to be more cropping I have to do in post. So the benefit of shooting in Academy is that I get a taller capture and less cropping in post, less wasted resolution. Yeah. Um, in fact, in fact, here's what's interesting. When we go to a micro four third sensor, you'll notice it's the exact same height. Actually, it's ever so slightly taller than the EVA sensor. Um, it's like within three one hundredths of a millimeter tall. And so when we shoot anamorphic on a micro four thirds camera versus shooting it on a super 35, you know, non academy, you effectively get the same look. You're going to get the same image um, in terms of the depth of field. So micro four thirds is a terrific format for anamorphic. In fact, it's why we started it. It's the sensor's natively four by three aspect ratio. It's the same aspect ratio as the original film stock. So it only made sense that we do this. Yeah. Um, so now the question is, what happens with my lenses, right? Well, this is the circle of coverage of an Atlas Orion. Um, it's a 31 millimeter image circle. That's diagonally measured. And you can see it covers, let's go back. Oh, great, I gotta go through all these. Sorry, folks, <laughs> wasn't thinking. Um, I want that to slide out one more time because I want you to pay close attention to the Academy crops, the green and the blue. So when we slide, an anamorphic lens over those, you see it covers all those. And the uh, the S1H, it gets a lot of vignetting. You're going to have, it's going to be an interesting look. Let's just say that that's going to be an interesting vignetted style. So this particular lens is not going to cover a lot of full frame stock. And clearly with uh, IMAX, it's not going to work at all. So um, that's why we look at things like uh, expander optics or um, we look for full frame versions, which they tend to get much more expensive but that's because they cover a lot larger sensor stock or film stock. So that would be the, the surface area that we would cover if we added an LF expander to the Atlas Orion lens. And so that's gonna lose about a stop of light, but it's gonna throw the light out into the corners more for us. It behaves like a teleconverter. So um, it's a one six teleconverter. You take the one six, multiply it by the aperture that tells you how much light you lost. Um, and so that's gonna give us that coverage for that full frame sensor. Or we can look at lenses like uh, products that are available from Cook um, that have the ability to cover a full frame sensor and give us an anamorphic squeeze as well. Um, there are several companies that are doing full frame anamorphics. Uh, one of the more affordable options is made by a company called Vazin. Um, Vazin will cover a full frame sensor. Uh, I believe it's an 85 millimeter anamorphic yep. lens. Um, yep. That one's about $8,000. So it prices out around where the Orion series from Atlas would price out a little less expensive than those. Um, so just so everybody understands, we wanna make sure you understand what covers the sensor. And we want you to understand that there's different shapes to sensors because they ultimately dictate what type of squeeze ratio you want out of your lens. So the sensor and its shape and size is gonna dictate what lens you're gonna get and how much squeeze it's gonna have. So let's yeah. talk about squeeze ratios. And actually, and I want to uh, jump in and actually um, address some of the questions that came through before we go too far sure. into the squeeze ratios. So um, one of the questions that, that did actually come through, and I know we're, we're going to address this a little bit later, um, is actually, I have to pull the question up on my phone because Jack just sent it over to me. Um, okay. When you're looking at a camera like the S1 or the S5, um, and again, I, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later. Um, you know, between an S1 and an S5, which would you choose for wanting to shoot anamorphic? Well, there's what would I choose today and what will I choose on the, on the new firmware update for the S1? Um, exactly where I, I was I'm leading you to. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. It's, it's, do I have a project today or do I have a project down the road? That's really what's going to come down to. Um, the S5 has all the anamorphic functionality that you need for most applications other than full frame. It's not going to do the. It's not going to do open gate. It's not going to give you the full sensor. It'll give you the academy region, which means ninety percent of all anamorphic lenses are designed for it. Um, so for me, if I had projects today, it'd be the S5. Um, Sean and I haven't played with the S1's new firmware. We know what it's going to get because we've made it public. It's going to get what the S5 gets for anamorphic. So yeah. um, it, it's really six and one and a half dozen of the other if you can wait for the S1 to get the update. 
Uh, you're not going to get anything more with the S1 for anamorphic than you already get now with the S5. Uh, when it comes to anamorphic, there's other things you get, but this is simply on an anamorphic topic. It's going to deliver the same anamorphic functionality. Yeah, and and you know from a look perspective, for those that are looking between those two cameras, remember that the S1, the S5, and the S1R don't have low pass filters on the sensors, so you want to look at at the image quality requirements that you need out of the cameras. In some cases, the S1H may be the better choice for you if you shoot in environments where more might become something that you want to be very apparent with uh, or very aware of. Um, one of the other questions here, um, and I do want to answer this one, was um, uh, from Mark asking, any possibility of a G9 firmware update for anamorphic D-squeeze like the GH5? Um, I think that's... I think that's highly unlikely um, that I, I just, we could ask. I just think it's highly unlikely that we would do it. Yeah, the, the G9 did get a lot of video uh, functionality updates, but uh, one of the things to remember is that the G9 is built differently than a GH5. So the general you know length of recording times between a G9 and a GH5, a lot of that stuff can kind of come into play. And you know, newer cameras are coming out that have, you know, added this stuff in, like, you know, we just talked about with the S5, the BGH1, which I'm using on. So uh, as Matt said, we'll we'll bring it up. Uh, our team watches these streams, so they see the questions and the comments you guys bring up, and um, they do take a look at it. Um, well, and, and something, yeah. something to expand on that. Remember, we're, we're having to use more of the sensor for our anamorphic mode, so we're actually going to be using the full sensor readout. And that does require significantly more processing in the camera. Um, so if you get, all right, so I'm, I'm going to give away a little cheat. There's a secret. I'll give you a secret. How does that sound? Um, if you shoot in the 6K anamorph, if you shoot in the 6K photo mode of the camera or the 4K photo mode of the camera, um, that'll give you the full sensor output. But you'll see it gives you very little recording time. So that should give you some idea of what would happen if we gave you uh, unfettered access to an anamorphic mode, plus the de-squeezing processing that has to happen. Um, I just, I don't think there'd be enough recording time to make it worth your while. Uh, again, I, I can't speak to that. I'm not the engineer, but yeah. just knowing that we can kind of do it and cheat with the 6K photo mode, and we can see the how little recording time we get for that, and then we extrapolate that with the de-squeezing and everything else, you, you kind of get an idea of what would happen to your recording times. Yeah. Well, cool. Let's um, let's uh, uh, continue with those uh, squeeze ratios now that we actually kind of went down that path as well. Okay. So we, we understand we have to pick a lens that's going to cover our sensor um, and not create vignetting, uh, especially with stabilization, which we'll talk about in a little bit because remember, the stabilizer can move and the vignetting can get even worse as it's moving around. Um, so then we talk about this, the shape of our sensor will ultimately determine... Um, Sorry, I keep hitting the wrong advance. I got two laptops in front of here. So, uh, so the squeeze ratio will ultimately deter be determined. You'll choose your squeeze ratio based on the shape of your sensor. So um, we have squeeze ratios like a 130 or a 133, which I have pictured here a 133. You also have a 15, so you can see it's getting progressively uh, taller and skinnier looking. This is a 18, which um, is becoming more and more popular, and I'll explain why in a little bit. And then um, the reference standards 2x. 2x anamorphics are the most commonly used in production. Uh, when you talk about post-production and post-workflows, when we have to de-squeeze this stuff, um, there's more software tools for de-squeezing 2x than there is any of these other ratios. Uh, 133 will usually have options in like uh, Adobe Premiere to be able to de-squeeze it. Um, otherwise, you're going to be doing a lot of math in order to get the squeeze ratio done right. Um, it's not that bad, really, but uh, you, you do have to understand how to de-squeeze it. So when we start looking at, come on. So we start looking at different sensor sizes. Um, this is the EVA 1. Um, there's the resolutions. It's We're, we're shooting right now in the UHD resolu resolution in this example. So it's 3840 by 2160 in this example. Uh, we take a 2x squeeze ratio. We squeeze that thing down. We compress it so it fits on the sensor. Um, now what you're going to end up with, with that 2x anamorphic lens, once we've de-squeezed it, our 2x anamorphic lens 
The sensor was 178 to one. That's 1.78 inches wide for every inch it is tall. We multiply that by two because it's two times squeezed. You now have an aspect ratio of 3.56 to one. It's like a pen. <laughs> it's like a pencil of video on your television monitor. So it's just it's more black bars than it is television. So or image. So when we use a 2x on a 16 by 9 sensor, we got to expand it so it fills up more of the screen. So we're cropping a lot more resolution off the edges. And then we're going to blow it up. We're going to magnify it. And you can see we ended up, I'm going to go back on this. So you can see you're at now 2560 resolution width. So then when we expand it out, now the computer has to interpolate that out to get us the 3840 by 21 or 1620 effective resolution that's there. So I tend not to like to shoot 2x anamorphics on 16 by 9 sensors. And by the way, some people say, well, what about cinema 4K? What if you went to 4096? Well, that just be worse because I have more resolution to the left and right. So that's why I use 3840 as the example. I'd be throwing away all that extra stuff if I'm shooting in Cinema 4K. So Cinema 4K is great if I want to kind of crop to CinemaScope. It's not going to be great when shooting anamorphic. Okay? Yeah. So if I use a 133 like the Sarui that um, my friend Sean has, let's see how this works. We're so friends now? One's well, we're, we're less enemies today. How does that sound? So, so you take 178 and you multiply it by 133. That comes out to a 237 to 1 aspect ratio. Um, it, most people look at CinemaScope and it's either 235 or 239 or 240. Uh, the truth is I've seen it go all the way from 220 to 278. Um, the point is 237 is right there in the wheelhouse of what would be proper CinemaScope. And that means when I put it on the monitor, I now have more of my resolution left to right. So I'm at exactly 3840 actually, because then it's de-squeezed from there. So I get really good resolution. I get the ratio that I'm looking for. Um, the drawbacks are it's not gonna be as strong an anamorphic look. You'll get the lens flares, but you're not gonna get the defocused bokeh, like what I'm getting with the 2X lens. So that's where four by three aspect ratio. Did you have a question, Sean? I just saw you raise your hand. No, no, no. so I, I uh, changed my uh, camera feed here. So I'm gonna, jump to my camera real quick here so this is what matt was just talking about that 16 by 9 so i changed the camera from shooting anamorphic into 16 by 9 this is cinema 4k to show you how much wider it gets and to matt's point when you have to scale this up look at how much is going to get lost on the sides here and you're still yeah. losing the height here as well yeah so that's, that's why we like to use four by three aspect ratio sensors. Um, some companies even have like one, two aspect ratios instead of one, three, three. So when we use a, a one, three, three, which is the four by three sensor, uh, you can see all the Panasonic cameras that can do this on the left side of the slide. I'm not gonna bore you and go through all of them. Um, when we squeeze that two X ratio and we compress it down, put it onto the sensor, um, what we end up with is a ratio one, three, three times two, that comes out to a two, six, six to one. So I can either deliver something that looks more like hateful eight and keep it at this two, six, six to one if I want, or I can do a little bit of cropping to get it to a two, four, oh, or a two, three, five aspect ratio. So to do a two, three, five, what we'd end up with is we go from, we're now dealing with almost 3000 pixels of resolution, and then we're cropping that down to make it fit. So we get more left to right pixel resolution, but we're also getting a taller capture. So we're getting shallower depth of field. We have wider angles to our lenses. So we get a wider effective um, angle of view from those, those lenses as well. Yeah. So if we use a 133 on a four by three sensor, we end up with, I'm sorry, if we use a 18 anamorphic. So this is a 18 squeeze on a four by three ratio sensor. Well, one, three, three times one, eight gives us two, three, nine to one. So it's CinemaScope, it's almost perfect. That's why one eights are becoming so popular because you don't have to worry about cropping. I personally like a little cropping on my anamorphics because uh, if I frame things wrong, I've got some room to be able to move things left to right. I just don't want a lot of cropping. <laughs> I'd like yeah. a little bit of cropping. So that's why four by three has become so popular for anamorphic workflow. Uh, but one eight's a phenomenal lens and it's gonna give you a lot of the character that you'd see in a two X anamorphic lens. Um, and so finally, let's talk a little bit about using uh, the open gate of the S1H um, cameras like an Aria Lex, well, like a Sony Venice. Um, they have an open gate function like this. Uh, there's the Alexa LF, which has this as well. 
So first off, you get a ton of resolution when you shoot this mode. You're at 6K of resolution. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of resolution to work with. Um, it's going to end up a three to one aspect ratio because it's a one five to one, uh, 1 1.5 inches to one inch tall. So once we do that, we de-squeeze, it, it's a three to one aspect ratio. But remember we have a ton of resolution here, so we can then crop that down. And we're not having to interpolate down to 3840 by 2160. So lots of cropping options when you're talking about a full frame sensor. But remember finding glass that can cover it's gonna be a little bit more of a challenge. So let's go into some pros and cons. So 133 anamorphics, their biggest pros really, um, 133s are great if you're shooting 60 by 9 sensor. They're going to deliver a, a cinemascope look, 237, 238 to 1, 239 to 1. Um, the other cool thing, though, that I love about them is if I use a 133 on a 4x3 sensor, I can deliver 16 by 9. So 133 times 133 comes out to a one, roughly 178. So you end up with a basically 16 by nine aspect ratio, it looks awesome. So it fills the whole screen like it normally would, but you get some of the anamorphic uh, benefits of it, which is really cool. Um, on a 3-2 sensor, they're great too, because they create uh, what's called univisium aspect ratio, that's two to one. Um, if you ever watch Netflix, almost every one of their scope programs are actually two to one, they're not in a two, three, nine. So if I use the, if I can get like a um, one, three, three full frame one on an S1H, I can deliver Univisium that looks just like, uh, you know, uh, Stranger Things in terms of its ratio. Yeah. Uh, if we use 1.5s, you know, I'm sorry, the drawbacks of 133s, they just don't look as anamorphic. They, they're more clinical looking. They're going to look more like, a, more like a circular lens or a spherical lens. That's its drawback. It's just not as much character. When we go to 1.5 to 1, uh, 1 five aspect ratio, again, I'm, I don't really understand this one that much, if I'm honest. <laughs> the best part about it is it, it, it works great on a 4x3 because it's going to give you 2 to 1. So Univisium, if you're going to deliver to Netflix, it's a great aspect ratio for that. Uh, a little bit more of the anamorphic look to it. Um, but again, we, we look at it, they're, they're really hard to find. There's not a lot of options for it. Um, you know, standard ratios, you're going to get a lot of cropping up. You have to do a lot of cropping with it. So um, that's where the 1.8s come in. If you just really want to deliver 239 and that's what you want to do, get a 1.8 anamorphic lens and they'll deliver, they'll deliver content in, on a four by three sensor in exactly 239 aspect ratio. Um, and they'll give you a, basically the same look as a 2X anamorphic. That's why Cook is moving to them because they look awesome when you do these open gate sensors with these large, uh, you know, 24 by 36 millimeter sensor sizes. Um, I think my biggest complaint with them is that they're just harder to work with in post. Um, I'd really like to see companies like, uh, like, you know, Apple with Final Cut, and I'd like to see Resolve, and I'd like to see um, Adobe add a de-squeeze, like a quick de-squeeze for one eights, because I think it's time. There's enough people shooting in it now. I think it's time to add it. Yeah, definitely. And, and then the 2X, we've already gone through this. I'm, I'm sure you guys are uh, begging me to move on, but that's the standard. So if you want the look, that's what 2X gives you the look. So with that said, Sean, what do we want to cover next? Let's see here. Um, let's take a look at some of the questions. Uh, I know a lot of people have been, um, you know, helping each other out, which again, if you guys are new to this, uh, if this is the first time you've been on the Lumix Live platform, this is probably one of the coolest uh, parts I've seen so far is everyone in the chat, some people who are working anamorphic as it is in their normal workflow, helping each other out, kind of guiding you guys in, you know, different areas so that it's not just you know, comments and recommendations from Matterai. You know, obviously we work for Panasonic. We have no affiliation to any of these lens manufacturers that we're talking about. And to answer some of the questions in there, no, Panasonic Lumix does not make anamorphic lenses ourselves. So that's why we are talking very much about Surui, Atlas, uh, Vizen, or Vizen, however it's pronounced. Um, but some of the questions in here were, which uh, let me just scroll back up to uh, some of them here. I uh, was asking about if I can see where that question was. You guys are great with the conversations in here. Um, just recapping here for Jason. Um, there is the firmware update coming um, first half of next year or early next year, I think is what we said, uh, for the S1 that's going to add the anamorphic functions that you see already currently in the S5 uh, into that camera. Now, 
I believe the anamorphic functionality and uh, the anamorphic functionality is just coming naturally, I believe, right, uh, Matt? That doesn't require the SFU2 uh, upgrade? Or they haven't not... told us that. They okay. haven't said for sure. So, so I, I, wish, I wish I could give an answer, but I, I don't feel comfortable saying until I know for sure. Yeah, so basically, um, I think Jack dropped some of the uh, the press release down there, so you guys can follow into that and see what's coming in that upgrade uh, in the future, uh, early sometime next year uh, for the S1. So it'll be brought up to uh, speed here. Uh, and Matt, you know what's funny is there's a lot of people in the chat here asking about you know a 1.75 XD squeeze or um, you know why why don't why isn't that something um, in the cameras? Uh, could you go into a little detail on that if you know anything about that? Because I haven't really looked at one one seven five. So I'll be completely honest with you. I have not seen a one seven five. That doesn't mean that they don't exist, or it's not possible that there aren't some lenses that say they're a two X, and then people have discovered they're actually a one seven five or a one eight. <laughs> um, the the one D squeeze I think we are missing, and I have asked for. Um, is 165 because 165 is uh, a, a, a pretty well known um, squeeze ratio. There's a company called Service Vision. They make the uh, Scorpions, uh, Scorpio line of anamorphics. They offer full frame 165s. Again, if you do some math, you'll see that they come out really, really well on a, on a 3 2 aspect ratio sensor. I think they're almost 240 to 1, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the big one is Panavision. Panavision offers a whole series of 165s for rental. Um, so you know, some of this is just we have to make a decision on how much engineering time we want to spend putting these squeeze ratios in, and we have to look at what comes available in the market. You know, at, at present, the only 165s available are either rental from, from Panavision or they're $30,000. So they don't necessarily match with where we are on our cameras. We try to give the squeeze ratios that um, hit the price points that make the most sense for where our cameras are priced at. So that that's that's the best answer I can give you. Yeah, and, for, and I'm sure someone's calling me a I'm sure someone's calling me a dirty liar, and they're going to point out the one seven five lens that I don't know. So um, let them let them please please make sure you type out Matt's a dirty liar. This is the lens. Uh, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> you ask, and the internet will will uh, provide Matt. Um, yeah. So I just want to touch on another point too, because I know um, I'm I'm already seeing what what I kind of figured was going to happen. Some people are. Um, you know, opening up other windows and checking out the price of some of these anamorphic lenses and <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is going to be the segue into this part of the topic, Matt. But um, yeah, as, as Jason has just found out um, by looking oh. at, at, at one of our uh, uh, retailers out there uh, that, you know, you're looking at about $8,000 for some of those yeah. different lenses. And those will be in either like EF or PL mount, you know, different mounts like that. But one of budget. The, by the way, that's a budget friendly one. Um, exactly. One is, what you guys, what you guys need to look up is the. Uh, you need to look up the Cook One Eight full frames. See what those cost you, or perhaps a uh, an Airy uh, Airy Master Prime anamorphic. See what that's going to cost you. Yeah. Um, that, that's or or better yet, my my absolute favorite because I love pronouncing it, the uh, Ingenue Optimos. Uh, the Ingenue Optimo Op. Uh, uh, zoom anamorphics. Take a look at those. Those seventy thousand dollars. Yes, I'm not. I, I did not stutter. Seventy grand. Oh yeah. But what's what's cool about this and why um, you know Matt and I felt that this was actually really you know a good time to start you know really talking about this more and using this platform to actually talk with all of you about it is because of companies like um, Surui and some of the stuff that Matt's going to cover uh, next here that are starting to bring the, the, the bar to enter much, much lower. Now, as we just covered, you know, they're one, three, three anamorphics. You're not going to get necessarily as much of the same look, but it's, it's a way to get into it and start, you know, with those kind of core things that people look for, you know, the lens flares, yeah. if, if you're all trying to do the JJ Abrams thing. It's a really easy well, plug and play way to do it. Well, let's let's walk through this next section because I think it'll yeah. help people. Um, because this is the way I started with anamorphic um, because I didn't have a spare ten thousand plus dollars kicking around. So uh, let's talk about DIY solutions first because I think it's the most cost effective way to get into this. Um, yeah. So we don't really project film much anymore in theaters. We usually are projecting digital projectors, and so. Um, all these theaters had lenses because remember, if we capture with an anamorphic lens, 
we have to project through an anamorphic lens. We just turn it 90 degrees. So when you turn that 90 degrees, it's now de-squeezing when it goes out, but it would squeeze the wrong way when it comes in. Well, if you use those projector lenses and you turn them 90 degrees and you uh, gaffers tape that to the front of your lens or use a proper <laughs> mounting solution to mount it to the front of your lens. Um, so you have your taking lens and then you have your anamorphic attachment. Bob's your uncle, you got an anamorphic lens and you're ready to go. So what I would suggest is that you go to eBay and you'll look for some anamorphic projector lenses. Um, you know, there's Secor, there's uh, Isco, there's um, Bell & Howell, there's Koa. There's a lot of different projector lenses you can get. And for a couple hundred bucks, um, you can actually see mine on the left. Um, this is like the first one I ever used. And uh, make sure you gaffers tape around the base of it. But um, and you're gonna you're gonna buy a, a you're gonna buy a little step ring that you're gonna attach to your your capture lens, and then you're going to um, in this case it's literally three screws that you put into the side of the lens. There are much nicer solutions in the next slide. I'll I'll I'll, I'll give you a resource to help you to to find um, ways to do this without destroying the anamorphic lens. But um, we take these two devices, we put them together. And now you've got an anamorphic lens. Now the, the drawback to it is that you have two focus points, right? You have a focus element on the anamorphic lens and we have a focus element on our taking lens. So doing focus pulls, yeah, it's not gonna happen here. And that's where this third option comes in, which is a, um, it's a diopter. Uh, this company calls it a range finder, but it's a little device that you put on the front of your anamorphic lens and then it turns and it, it moves that diopter further away or closer to the camera and that gives you, that's your focusing lens. So you just focus the two elements once and then you use the range finder to pull focus. So, you know, a whole solution like this, about a thousand bucks all told, um, including your capture lens potentially, and you got yourself an anamorphic lens. And the nice thing is you can adapt this to different focal lengths. So it's one anamorphic element that you can put on different focal lengths and you can get different looks, which is great. Um, so there's a company, and I, obviously I'm not endorsed by them. Uh, I've included a QR code. So if any of you want quick access to their website, um, you can just QR code scan that. Uh, they're called the Anamorphic Store. Uh, these guys are awesome. They can help you source anamorphic glass. They have an eBay store for doing it. But my favorite thing is they have really great solutions to mount your anamorphic lens to your taking lens. And remember, it's important that you understand what your taking lens can, can accomplish because every sensor size with certain front elements, um, you don't want to see the inside of the element. You don't want to literally see a barrel of the inside of the element because you shot with a 12 millimeter lens and that anamorphic lens can only cover a 50 millimeter lens. Um, the anamorphic store, they have a lot of great resources that can help you to know which anamorphic lenses can accommodate the widest aspect ratio lenses. And they'll also help you to know um, which ones work best for micro four third sensors versus uh, you know academy region sensors. So. Um, this is a great resource if you want to start building your own lenses. I would I would highly recommend them. So then we have the build built for you solutions. And so on the left side of the screen here we have um, this is a, uh, this is the uh, Sarui lens that Sean's using. Um, this is a Vazin, and a Viz Vazin lenses in Micro Four Thirds you can get them for about three thousand dollars, and they're really well built. They have beautiful look to them, a, a great aesthetic, a really sharp lens. And then um, this is SLR Magic. They make a series of three micro four thirds, two times squeeze lenses. They also make one three threes and EF mount and PL mount. Um, and all these are gonna be somewhat attainable. Um, the Vazin full frames get up to about $8,000, which is much cheaper than a full frame uh, cook, you know, one eight. And so then that's where we come into the middle. Most of the other lenses you'll see are PL and, and almost all the time they're primes. That's the most common use. Um, if we look here, this is the cook and this is the um, atlas. And so these are what we call front element anamorphics. So the anamorphic lens element is on the front of the lens, okay? Then we have the service vision Scorpio, which is right here. And we have the Airy master prime anamorphic, which is here. And those lenses, they actually have a progressive squeeze. So there's elements in it that are progressively squeezing to create the anamorphic look to get you to 2X. Uh, it gives it a sharper, cleaner look, a little less character. Um, so the Cook and the Atlas lenses typically are larger 
by and large, oftentimes are larger than the service vision or the Aries. Uh, that's the benefit of doing it progressively is that you can make the system overall smaller because that anamorphic element has to be huge, especially yeah. if a wider angle lens. Um, then you can see some zooms. You know, Cook makes an anamorphic zoom. Uh, they, I think they make two of them. I know that uh, Ingenue makes two. And uh, this is about to scale, actually, between these two lenses. So when you look at them, um, yeah, the Cook is enormous because it's a front element anamorphic. And the Ingenue is a rear. So that little protrusion there, that's actually the anamorphic element. So it can be much smaller, but you're not going to get a lot of the anamorphic look. So some people just want the ratio and the lens flares, but they don't want the bokeh and the de-squeeze. So rear elements do that. And so remember that you can create your own kind of character and look to it, depending on where the anamorphic elements are. So uh, Sean, that brings us to uh, what will probably be the last topic for the call. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a bugaboo of mine. Um, I see a lot of anamorphic stuff shot on our cameras out there. And I see a lot of people leaving the stabilization on. And God love you. It's causing some problems. So I want to I want to try to fix some of these problems. So would we would we have a five axis stabilizer? I'm going to I'm going to just go to my um, I'm going to go to my camera for right now. Yeah. And I'm actually going to take this second here to um, to just uh, comment on some of the stuff that's going around in the uh, chat there. Um, so as Matt said before, um, we're we were using uh, anamorphic store as just one of the resources that we know that's out there. Uh, Again, the cool thing about this platform and seeing all of you guys in the chat there, um, you guys know that there are always more than just one place to find, um, you know, content, find uh, sources for recommending lenses, um, you know, guiding you through that path. Uh, I see that there's a couple uh, recommendations down in the chat, so definitely have that conversation with everyone there. And... Remember that a lot of what we're talking about when it comes to some of the different lens recommendations, when we looked at the, the different tiers, you know, the budget entry level all the way up to the pro higher end cinema level, that's just what's out there. Um, you know, look at the work from your peers, uh, have conversations with those out there because you'll find that some may have really good experience with certain lenses. Some may not have that great of an experience with another lens, but our goal is to provide you guys with as much information as you can or as we can so that you can make an informed decision with all of that information. So, yeah. And I think it's, a, I think it's important to note, I'm not going through every anamorphic brand that's out there. Yes. I know there's companies like Hawk and there's the old Koa lenses and um, there's old Russian anamorphic optics that are out there as well. Um, this is really just to kind of educate you on what to be looking for when you're specking your lens so that you understand what the squeeze ratios mean and how they are impacted by this, the aspect ratio of the sensor. And really, we're just trying to keep you to trying to help you to avoid making some errors that I made as I was doing stuff. Um, and so I, I, I went back to the, the camera with me on camera. So I'm going to um, I'm going to shut down the PowerPoint for a moment here. Yeah. Uh, second. Uh, Cause I, I want to talk, I want to uh, heart to heart, just, just us. Um, <laughs> so I want to explain that when we have a, an in-body stabilizer, like what we do in the S1 or the S5 or the GH5, um, there's a roll component to the stabilization. And remember that lens is a cylinder. <laughs> so when we roll it, you begin to get a lot of jello -y looking footage. And so, um, I hear a lot of people complaining, especially like the S1H, where they say, oh, my God, I got so much rolling shutter on the S1H and I shoot anamorphic. And I look at the footage and I say, well, what'd you do with the stabilization? And it turned out it was the stabilizer the whole time that's causing a lot of this. I'm not saying that, you know, a full frame sensor will have less occurrences of rolling shutter. Obviously, the bigger the sensor, the more obvious it is. But all of this gets amplified with anamorphic lenses. Rolling shutter becomes more obvious with anamorphic lenses, and then it gets completely blown out of proportion when we have an image stabilizer in conjunction. So I'm going to switch over to uh, my other camera, and we're going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so we're going to go to the video mode, Jump and we're going to switch. Okay. And so uh, now, oh, there we, now go. we should have my other camera. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to my camera's menu right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on, you can't see this right now because there's just no way for me to output this. Um, but what we can do is we have a stabilizer setting. 
And under able, image stabilizer settings right now, I'm going to put it in the standard stabilizer mode that we would normally have um, for our, a, 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 a spherical element. And what I want you to do is I want you to pay very close attention to the tree in particular, okay? The tree is really where you want to look. Uh, you can look at either one, the plastic small one or the big one. And I'm just going to roll my tripod so that we're allowing the sensor to try to roll and correct. And what you should notice right now is it gets kind of wobbly and it looks kind of jello-y. And so it actually that does jello, it. Uh, hold on. <laughs> hey, this is always the fun about doing it live, you know? Yeah, give me one second here. Um, just to make sure, I, I might have it on a lens that's got it programmed in. So that's that's kind of the cool things um, with with how much flexibility you have in a lot of our cameras. You know, you have all of these different. Uh, if you're in the S1H, you have you can program in different lenses, different you know kind of correction capabilities. And we're back okay. here. It may not be showing. It's showing it for me. It may not be showing it because of the compression. But it, it, you end up getting this weird sort of jelly look. Um, here, let me do something. I see if I can <laughs> see if I can see if I can amplify it a bit. Um, Red Dawn News is uh, commenting. Ah, I'm getting nauseous. <laughs> well, that's good. That's that's the point. Um, yeah, see? So I'm good, now going to turn on the um, the I'm mean, now going to put on the optimized for anamorphic mode for stabilization, which corrects for the two X anamorphic, and now you can see that it rolls perfectly with the camera. And in fact, if I shut the stabilizer off, you'll get the exact same look. So let me just turn the stabilizer off. And again, it rocks the same without the jello. So with anamorphic lenses, it's always best to either not use stabilization or make sure that you um, have the anamorphic stabilization that's optimized for your D squeeze. Yeah. And so uh, that failed miserably to, to, to translate over the internet. So I apologize folks, but it, it, it's, it's wobbly on my end. I can promise you that. Nah. And that's, it, that's, that's also kind of, again, what's funny is, you know, doing this stuff live, you know, it, it, I was seeing it very clearly before. Um, but obviously when you have uh, compression, we have a whole bunch running on here, you know, Sometimes it just doesn't look as good, but everyone I think has seen the the look and the effect that that you're talking about. Um, I know a couple people in the chat have been commenting about that. So perfect. Um, so that's really what we wanted to cover in this. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming there's maybe some more questions in the the chat. Um, no, no. Just so everybody knows, no, there um, there is not an autofocus anamorphic lens. So you are not going to be able to do out of focus. Uh, just want to make sure I got that out there. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see, just uh, answering some of the questions. Looks like some people had come in a little bit late. Uh, Albert, yes, both of us are using uh, anamorphic lenses. We are using uh, different styles. Uh, Matt is using a 2X anamorphic. So you get that beautiful, you know, just, just gorgeous oval bokeh, all that kind of fun stuff. And I have a more moderate uh, 133 anamorphic, which gets some of the effect. So you still get the flaring, you get some of the look, some of the compression look, but your bokeh doesn't go as, as overly. Um, the 50 millimeter from uh, Surui does give you more of an oval uh, look than the 35 that I'm using right now. Uh, but, you know, you get this kind of, ooh, flare. Um, one of the things I wanted to actually bring up, Matt, because uh, we're actually, we're coming up to where we got to wrap up for this week. Um, setting some of the expectations for some people, I think, uh, a lot of the market, when we look at modern cinematographers and, and photographers and hybrid shooters that are coming from this DSLR, DSLM, uh, you know, mirrorless world, we're used to seeing spherical lenses that are designed to be critically sharp, like, like ridiculously detailed and sharp. What 
should someone expect when you're getting into this anamorphic um, that may help them understand what they're getting out of this, um, you know, sharpness-wise, that kind of thing? Uh, you're, you're probably not going to get sharp if it's a front mount ele anamorphic element. Um, it's going to have it's going to have character. So uh, if you don't like lens breathing, you don't want to shoot anamorphic because front element anamorphic lenses are going to breathe. They're going to create the angle of view is going to change as you change focus point. That's just what in the nature of the design of a front element system. Um, you know, they tend to be softer in the corners because again, you know, it's a, it's a um, cylinder. It's not a sphere. So the out that the upper corners of that lens are physically further than the, than certain other parts. So it's not, it's literally going to be a, a a distorted looking image that's by its nature so if you want to shoot anamorphic but you want a cleaner look that's where rear element anamorphics like what ingenue does or getting a rear a, a, a rear element adapter that can work with other pl lenses works um that's why airy does what they do by um in service vision by having a progressively squeezing series of elements for the anamorphic look and so it gives you that cleaner sharper image um but you know, typically anamorphic lenses are not gonna deliver the sharpest, most pristine looking image. Um, that's just not what is in their nature. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, for, for a lot of other people too, you know, looking at you, there's different coatings too, right? With some lenses that are designed to suppress that lens flare or to more accentuate it. Like I think mm -hmm. a, a big clear example is the way your lens, the, the Orion lens that you're using flares versus the way the uh, Surui lens, I'm going to eventually be able to pronounce it correctly. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> Some lenses have a really harsh, uh, harsh isn't necessarily a word, a really pronounced flare where others have that kind of like yours, that kind of creamy, it's it's super stringy and it's flary. It's 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 there. So looking at, at what the characteristics are, know that you're probably not going to be able to match 100% what somebody else is doing unless you know exactly what lens that person's using. But you can get pretty close. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and keep in mind that some companies like Airy, they even have a removable. Um, lens coated element on the front of the lens that's designed to be removed. Um, Cook makes two different versions of their lenses, one that has one of the coatings removed, one that has the coatings all in place. Um, but yeah, it just depends on how how flary you want to get the system. So, but that's that's not uncommon for all cinema lenses. You know, companies like uh, uh, Sigma has just started offering um, uncoated versions of their cinema lenses, uh, yeah. the sphericals, to, to give you more character in the flare. You know, it's it's very much a uh, you know, photographers have one aesthetic, cinematographers have another aesthetic, you know, it's, it, some, a lot of photographers just don't have a uh, desire to have a lot of that flaring in their images when they're shooting video. So I get it. And that's where some of those other lenses can fill in that void, but still give you the anamorphic style that you're looking for. Yeah. Now the, the last thing I just want to, um, I, talk about because it's one thing you know we talked about all the lenses we talked about you know obviously the s series cameras the micro four thirds cameras um but as a piece of information for a lot of the people there or that are here what kinds of adapters do you use and do you have one that's kind of felt maybe a little more working better for you or is it kind of just they're all really versatile for what you're using yeah, so for the Micro Four Thirds adapters, the ones I've used for Micro Four Thirds, it's almost always PL because I've never shot anything other than PL anamorphics other than when I built, uh, you know, a DIY solution. Um, so most of the time it's PL adapters. Uh, I've used the um, Hot Rod Camera adapters, which are very well built. They're incredibly well engineered. In fact, I think um, Ilya Freeman at Hot Rod, I think he released the very first Micro Four Thirds PL adapter that was ever available. So um, it's exceptionally well built. I've also worked with the wooden camera PL adapters. And I'm very satisfied with their performance. Um, Kipon makes a really interesting PL adapter for Micro Four Thirds <laughs> that has a focal, re a focal reducer. Some of you will call it a speed booster. So I can get an even shallower depth of field out of those anamorphic lenses and get more light gathering out of it. Um, I will warn you, it doesn't work with every lens because some lenses have a deeper yoke um, off the back of there, actually. That um, was a fun yeah. thing that Matt and I yeah. found out at Cinegear the year we planned to use them. <laughs> yeah, if you see how shallow this flange back is, well, some of them are come back like this far and the back element's really far in, and then you can't use that 
So it's, it's a limited number of lenses, although a lot of anamorphics work with it and I've used it before. Um, and it gives you sort of that, it, 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 it makes the micro four third sensor become that academy region. It's actually a little bit bigger than academy at that point. It's, it's really a nice, a nice look. Um, for the, for the um, full frame sensor cameras, like what I'm shooting here now, uh, I hate to say it because it's one of the most expensive adapters, but man, that Sigma MC31, it is so nice. They give you lots of shims with it so you can get it set correctly for your lenses so you can focus to infinity. Um, our lens mount has a little threaded hole that allows you to then, when you mount the lens, you can take a little screw and stick it in and screw the mount into place. So important with anamorphic lenses because if that mount shakes, remember you're gonna get that jello roll again. <laughs> we don't want that. So I can, it, it's like it's bonded. It's like it's been welded to the camera when you use it. But I've also had really good luck with the wooden adapters. They're, they're really well built too. Um, but you know, do some digging, work with people who've used more adapters than I have. Um, those are the ones I've had experience with and I've loved the woodens and I really love the Sigmas for the full frames. Yeah. Well, awesome. Um, so obviously we're, we're a little long on, on this week's session. So we do unfortunately have to cut this, uh, this stream at the end here. So, um, Matt, thank you so much for all of the knowledge that you shared with everybody and the, um, the, the PowerPoint and the presentations and all, well, not PowerPoint, the slides that you shared with everybody. Um, it's key. It's keynote. Get it okay. right. It's there keynote. Fine. And keynote. thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for paying attention. Um, hopefully, you didn't fall asleep during the presentation. <laughs> now, what's cool too is uh, for everybody that is in here that wants to be able to reference this stuff later on, uh, all of our Lumix live streams are archived right on the uh, YouTube platform here. So, uh, within about an hour of us finishing this stream up, it should be uh, loaded up into the Lumix Live playlist. You'll be able to play it back anytime you want. Um, and always have all this kind of information. Um, one thing I am going to say, uh, and Matt, you're probably going to laugh at this. Uh, for those that are asking, uh, I just saw the question come up from Steve. We don't have information about a GH6 or anything that's coming next. So sorry, guys. Uh, you'll know when we know. Um, keep keep yourself subscribed to these channels. Uh, watch us. Uh, you know, obviously take a look at the descriptions of the videos before we go live. It'll give you an idea of what it is we're talking about during that stream. Uh, make sure to get registered for um, uh, the emails, all those other kind of platforms. Uh, one thing we do want to bring up, uh, there are, for those of you that are Lumix S-Series shooters right now uh, and have been looking at ways to get better uh, support, uh, make sure you maybe go take a look at the Lumix Professional Services if you're here in the United States. Uh, I can only speak for the United States customers. Um, there is a promotion running right now if you've been on the fence about getting into Lumix Professional Services. Uh, some of the requirements may have changed a little bit during this promotion, so you may want to go take a look at that. Uh, and uh, for those, uh, one little note I do want to actually mention because I did get asked about this right before the stream. Um, we have uh, a lot of research going on out in the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all these different platforms. Um, when you guys are reporting in on a lot of those platforms, when you're commenting here in the chat, uh, when you're interacting with any of us on Facebook or anything like that, I know that we're taking your comments, we're uh, taking your suggestions, any issues that you guys may be having, and we are reporting them up into our teams. Uh, through that kind of feedback that everyone has been giving us is what we use to deliver you know, future firmware updates and bug fixes and things like that. So I, uh, this is a preemptive thank you all out there for interacting with us over the, uh, the times that you guys have been with the, the brand using our equipment. Uh, and with that, I'm going to actually wrap it up again, Matt, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. Uh, thank all of you in the chat for joining us as well. And we will be back next Thursday at 2 PM Eastern time with, uh, Ross from the UK, one of our ambassadors in the UK, to talk about holiday photography and portraits and things like that since we are in this you know time of year. So I think a good solid 180 degrees from video and anamorphic. But uh, yeah, so with that, again, thanks everybody. Talk to you all next week. Thanks.